Welcome to Sex Care is Self Care, a conversation on women's sexual health brought to you by the Patty Brisbane Foundation for Women's Sexual Health. I'm your host, Patty Brisbane. Sex Over 70 has become a hot topic and was even recently featured in the New York Times. Today, we talked to the PBF Medical Advisory Board members, Dr. Christine Beccaro and Dr. Sherelle Inglesia, about sex after 70. Are you really ever too old to have sex? Hmm. Dr. Beccaro, let's start with you. Is so, sex after 70 a realistic goal? And can you be too old to have sex? Well, I'll tell you, gosh, Patty, I hope um, it is a realistic goal, um, not just for my patients, but for myself personally. You know, age, age is just a number. We've all, we've all heard that. And I think as I progress in years, um, I say it more and more because, um, you know, all sorts of health, mental, physical, sexual health, is um, age, age is just really a number. It's more about your functional status. Um, so I see, and I know Dr. Glacy as well, we see women thriving in their 80s and 90s, not just their 70s, because mm -hmm. they have taken care of their bodies and their minds and are physically active and, and do all the, the right things for themselves. And I've seen women in their 40s that are wheelchair bound and have very poor quality of life. So it's really, it's really not at all about age. It's more about um, functional status. And then um, even if there are physical limitations, learning how to um, navigate specific challenges for patients so they can have a healthy and enjoyable um, sexual life. And it doesn't always mean, you know, vaginal penile penetration or penetrative intercourse, but that lots of forms of um, sexual contact that can be really um, pleasurable, even if potentially um, intercourse isn't possible. Go, Dr. Inglesia, what are some of the accommodations an older couple must make in order to have sex? <laughs> Sounds like a crazy question. I know. It reminds me of that 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 funny saying that um, uh, a good man is hard to find, but a hard man is good to find. Because <laughs> when you look at erectile dysfunction, I don't know, you might want to cut that out of the podcast, but there's that 50, 60, 70 rule. Like 50% of men over 50, 60 over 60, and 70 over 70 have some kind of erectile dysfunction. Um, add that on to the level of pelvic floor disorders and um, uh, GSM, the dry vagina, that 50% of women um, uh, past three years past the menopause uh, will have. So then, you know, we have to make some accommodations. But you, you referenced that, um, that New York Times article. Um, and in that article, there's a, there were two um, PhD scientists, it was Peggy Kleinplatz and Dana Menard, uh, who did a long study and they wrote a book and they have a wonderful podcast on extraordinary lovers and um, keeping the ability to have magnific magnific magnificent sex, <laughs> that's a word, um, all the way past the 70s. And um, if you look at the data, there's this MIDA study, which was on midlife in, in the US, which um, surveyed thousands of um, men and women. Um, I think there was over 7,000 in the study. And um, a, uh, at the age of 65 or over the age of 65, 40% of people were still having sex once a month and 30% were having it once a week. So people are still having sex way past uh, their 70s. And now the biggest predictor of still being uh, satisfied sexually is actually, you know what it is, Patty? <laughs> Go ahead, tell us, what is it's, it? It's actually having a romantic partner. Um, so- um, Oh, so your bedroom toy doesn't count? Uh, <laughs> no, I we'll mean talk about that later. The battery, uh, the battery operated boyfriends are okay. Bobs are okay too, but um, that was the biggest predictor of um, uh, being sexually active. So I um, think that the accommodations that people have to understand with aging is that you know, with aging, there's decreased blood flow, there's a decreased innervation, and many of the the drugs and the um, therapies that we have are designed to increase blood, blood flow, release nitric, nitric acid, and do things to stimulate nerves. Um, and so 
that is the, there's a, some of the accommodations we have to make. I'm, I'll talk a little bit more about relationship issues because I think that plays a big role, you know, but I actually think that the conversation should change a little bit into like, not what's gone wrong, but like, what can you do to what's going right? You know, how to, how to, um, get it on and keep it going um, and focusing on what's going right. Cause I think, you know, particularly we as doctors, sometimes I think we over medicalize things a bit. So um, by focusing on what's going right in terms of what's functioning, um, I, I think you can overcome, you know, some of the um, uh, physical uh, uh, things that, are, that occur with age. So we can look yeah, more into that. There you go. I, I know that it's in here. I promise. Um, <laughs> yeah. Dr. Ricaro, how do medications and chronic illnesses impact sexual function? Yeah, Patty, I think at least in my practice, I have so many patients uh, because of our just mental health crisis in the country. It's so many patients on medications that can negatively impact their sexual function. The most, the, one of the largest mm-hmm. categories is, um, SSRIs, so selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, which are commonly you know, Prozac, um, Paxil, Zoloft, things like that. And these can really, um, especially for even for older adults any, and younger uh, patients too, can directly affect um, and have difficulty achieving orgasm and also um, impede their desire. So those, I feel like I see that medication as one of the most common reasons for um, impacting sexual function. And then certainly for older adults, you know, most of them on other medications like blood pressure medications um, and heart, other heart condition medications that also can limit their sexual function. Um, and then cancers are obviously are also really common in this age group. So for, for women, that's, you know, typically breast cancer, which again is about one out of eight patients um, that has breast cancer. And then they, if they're on any medications that um, influence their hormone levels to help suppress recurrence of breast cancer, that can also negatively impact their their libido and their, um, their sexual function leading to dry vaginas and things like that. So, and then for males, it's very typical for, um, them to have prostate cancer and have had a surgery to remove the prostate, which leaves them, um, with erectile dysfunction. And I would say a good chunk of my patients, when we talk about, um, other surgeries for, uh, pelvic floor conditions, already have noted that their partner, um, has erectile dysfunction and the, and the most common reason or one of the common reasons is prostate surgery um, or erectile dysfunction because of um, a blood flow issue. So, you know, and other conditions that Dr. Glacey and I see really commonly that affect a woman's sexual functioning are, you know, pelvic organ prolapse, which just means that things are, you know, the organs are falling out through the vagina, um, urinary and fecal mm-hmm. incontinence. All these conditions um, directly impact a woman's um, functioning and her ability to feel good about her body image. Um, so treating these conditions are usually very beneficial. Um, and then there's of course other things, pelvic pain, sexually transmitted diseases, sleep and mood disorders, but also um, uh, older, older adults are not, um, you know, they're, they also have these conditions. So. It's, it's important to kind of get a full history and physical um, in our older adults and to confirm and know what, um, what ways we can help them. You know, there's for men, there's certain, there's lots of medications for erectile dysfunction. And as we've, we already know, there's lots more meds for men than there are for women, but, um, mm-hmm. uh, for, but it's, sometimes it's really important to treat the man, right? I have had a few patients who um, really miss intimacy with their partner and um, I need to encourage the woman to tell her husband to go to the, her, his primary care doctor um, or urologist and get a prescription for Viagra so that they can still engage in, in sexual activity. So sometimes it's, it's um, counseling the woman on how to treat her partner. And sometimes it's about um, counseling her and getting treatments for her. Okay. As doctors, let me ask you this question. When we're talking about med- medications that affect um, desire and, and do doctors, when they're prescribing these medications, do they go over what can happen? Um, you may experience this because I know when you, when you receive medications, they have like a whole book on what might happen in the print is tiny. So, you know, are they, are they talking to their patients about this? Gosh, Patty, I, you know, we always hope 
that's the fact, but yeah. I will tell you in my experience, um, doctors times with patients are short, yeah. um, and counseling on medication side effects usually pertain to life-threatening or really very poor adverse outcomes that may occur or serious drug drug interactions less commonly um quality of life side effects um, are discussed so when we're talking about sexual health um although i'm sure dr glacy and i commonly talk about this i would say that i'm guessing a majority of healthcare providers don't talk about it not because it's not important but because their time is so limited and they don't want to harm the patient. So they focus more on potentially harm or prevention of harm rather than um, counseling about quality of life uh, side effects. Okay. All right, Dr. Inglacia, although pregnancy is not a concern, but I have, I have seen those articles where they say she got pregnant at 96. <laughs> <laughs> STIs could be... Um, a concern. How do we combat this? Yeah, I think we talked about this in the, in the teen section. Um, no glove, no love. It's, you know, you need a condom. So here's the deal. I mean, right now the divorce rate, isn't it at 51%? So in America, so a lot of people, um, then we're, we talked about social media as well and the dating apps. So they're getting onto the dating apps and, you know, unless you are in a mutually monogamous relationship where this person is only sleeping with you. And um, then again, um, and they've been tested for HIV and uh, syphilis and, you know, everything else and they're not having a discharge. Um, then you can not use a, a condom, but if someone has herpes, you know, that one, you have to use a condom, um, you know, and even the use of a condom with herpes, with active lesions, uh, you can still get herpes because it's that transmissible just from touch. So, and understand that maybe even just not having um, uh, vaginal intercourse, you can still get sexually transmitted infections uh, through anal sex, through oral sex, and possibly through fingering, even with, um, you know, if there was HIV with herpes, I think um, taking a good sexual history and knowing the full family tree of the person you're sleeping with is important, um, you know, in order to prevent that and have <laughs> the full family tree, if you know what I mean, Patty. Yeah, I mean, it can be layers and layers of branches. <laughs> there could be a lot of branches for some. <laughs> oh, good. I don't know if that's ever really going to happen that you're going to know everything and everyone, yeah. but, and, and, you know, and I actually have had patients, they're like, you know, in their sixties and seventies, and I'm telling them that they have herpes and that they're devastated, you know, they feel shameful, you know, and I say 80% of people have been exposed. And I said, you actually could have had this for a long time. You know, if you had a herpes ulcer and I tried it, you know, and um, like a cold sore because your grandma kissed you when people say that, you know, yeah. HSV one can go to HSV two. So don't, don't be ashamed uh, about that. Now, um, you know, syphilis and uh, gonorrhea, chlamydia, you know, those can be HIV that can all be um, prevented with use of a condom. So yeah, again, a good sexual history of, um, for your partner is, um, is important. And that's, it's, it's interesting because I feel like particularly with a lot of these dating apps, some of them are just designed for transactions, you know, transactional sex, and you may not have the condom with you, but that you still have to take that precaution. So I just remember having these little mirrors I was leaving out that were just these little compacts and the condoms are in a secret compartment in the compact. I just kind of had them leave it around the house for my daughter's friends. You know, if you have this little, it's a mirror, but there's a secret protect yourself, you know? Yeah. I love that. That is, that's great. It, it's there without you even happen to say it's there for you. Um, Dr. Vicara, what are some creative ways to maintain pleasure after 70 when intercourse is not feasible? Gosh, the sky is the limit here. And I think yeah. um, 
the key to talking about uh, talking about this to women is just exploration, understanding some of the limitations to help guide them a little bit. Um, but all forms of touching feel good. Um, it, it, of course, you know, in the right context in a in a caring, loving relationship. And orgasm doesn't have to be the end all be all of the event. So a lot of couples, um, you know, do a lot of caressing from head to toe, sensual massage, and any any form of touching usually is very pleasurable. Um, you know, and then of course there's the use of specific toys and accommodations for for women. Um, but first, I want to talk just about accommodations. You know, patients in their 70s a lot of times have had hip replacements or you know joint replacements, and it is difficult for them to get in certain positions. Um, uh, to if they do want to have penetrative intercourse. And so sometimes just telling them, look, you know, you can, you know, your partner can be in the bed, you can stand. There's all these different ways knowing their limitations. And again, I think um, some of our physical therapist colleagues do a good job at uh, talking to patients about accommodations as well, that it doesn't have to be the traditional, um, you know, male on top in the bed um, situation. There's all sorts of different um, positions and and toys that they can use. And then some, some women, which a surgery that uh, Dr. Glace and I performed, some women have had a closure of their vagina and, and sexual intercourse is absolutely not possible at all because it, we've, we've surgically altered their anatomy to treat a, a debilitating condition. But the good news is they still have their clitoris readily available. So again, even, even if the vagina is not open and usable, the clitoris is where all the sexual sensation is. And again, vibrators um, that focus on the clitoral glands um, still can feel very, very, very good. Um, and even if uh, the male partner can't get an erection, still touching and caressing, all the areas still feel really, really good. So just, again, we've said it a lot, permission, giving that permission to explore and experiment with different, different um, positions and different toys um, is really important to, to normalize that it's still still an important part of health and sexual health. Again, sexual health matters, and we need to say it so that patients um, have that empowerment. Yeah, I think uh, that conversation with your significant other and being able to be open and try different things because there could be a time where you cannot have intercourse, but in, intercourse is not the end all be all of any relationship. And I think touch is so important. And, you know, people ask all the time about with our company, like, well, can I become addicted to a vibrator? Well, you know, vibrator can do a great job for you, but it cannot replace touch mm -hmm. and having that partner and having them touch and caress your body is so important. And that's one thing a bedroom toy cannot do for you. So I'm glad we had this conversation. Uh, Dr. Iglesia, can you talk to us about how marital strain and infidelity can impact sex? Yeah, <laughs> um, you know, that was interesting in that article in the New York Times because uh, there was a relationship that sustained uh, a couple um, uh, affairs um, and actually grew uh, uh, as a result of it because to some degree, one of the, the, the partners actually upped his game. <laughs> so I feel that there, the, the, the issue about intimacy is going to uh, fall on um, emotional connectedness. And obviously when there's a sense of distress um, and a betrayal, it's uh, you're not gonna feel as emotionally connected, right? Um, and then there's also, you know, all of the other uh, shame that you might feel that were you not good enough? Well, well, you know, you're competing with somebody who's like 20 years younger. Um, there is someone who's like, she's prettier, she's thinner, she's smarter. I mean, we judge ourselves so much um, as women that, that that could be a real big blow to one's ego, um, having a partner who then strays. It's, it happens commonly. Uh, it's, it's nothing that we do, but I think that's where, if, if this is a commitment 
and we're not being coerced or not being abused, um, there are couples counseling can be extremely helpful, you know. Well, do you really think couples can benefit from counseling? Do I really think so? Sure. Yeah, yeah so definitely. Um, and again, the people, and it was in that same, uh, that, that book, Magnificent Sex, what it says is that the people who are having like um, the best sex, the magnificent sex, actually it began in the midlife. And sometimes it can happen after a, an affair such as that. It's because um, you've learned from it. You learn to be present. The people who are having the magnificent sex are excellent communicators. They're also empathetic. So perhaps um, they empathize a bit as to what happened. Um, they're able to forgive. They're able to get back that intimacy. And they have a sense of... Um, being adventurous, fun, and okay with being erotic, you know, trying different things. I mean, who doesn't think that hotel sex is better than sex? And, you know, I think sex <laughs> is the best because <laughs> you're out of the same, same old, same old routine. So being that, that adventurous, being willing to um, try something different um, and making it fun um, I think that's what people call bliss. And essentially, um, the definition of being intimate can, can change, right? I mean, it's not necessarily about penetration. As you said, probably just that connectedness and the touch, the massage, the caressing, the sense of, um, um, you know, I have that emotional connectedness. That's probably the sexiest thing. There you go. I agree. And I think counseling can benefit every single couple. I really do. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Michelle Obama and Brock had it. I, I did. I actually like it. It's so validating. <laughs> it is. And it, it also teaches the one that felt the, the male, female, yeah. or same sex, the person that feels they have no voice, they learn to have and be able to say to their partner what their wants and needs and are. Yeah. And I, I think it's just a safe space and it's so healthy. And well, I, I think every couple should give it a try. They're trained to, to be able to, to, to uh, bring out those feelings, but also to name it. And then to, to you know, to, to, uh, to acknowledge, you know, the concerns that you're having, your fears, your right. very, very helpful. And, and even like the, the cultural and social and religious mores that are kind of hindering you. They give you permission, you know, and some limited advice and maybe some limited information for some specific recommendations. That's called the placid model. Well, we, helpful. we've talked so often about, you know, even, and I'm sure that this can cancer care, it's just not one doctor. It's a team. It's a tribe. Yeah. And I really think even in when it comes to our relationship, again, it's a tribe. It's putting all the great people surrounding ourselves so that we are healthy and a better couple. So I'm all for it. Dr. Vercaro, what does science say about continued sex through the senior years? Is it good? It can be very good. And science says it's happening. So, <clears throat> you know, I frequently for my patients here, you know, at whatever age they think that they don't need to have or they don't want to have or it's not happening, um, a sexual uh, life, that, that it's just normal to stop having sex. And if that's the partner's combined um, philosophy and they've, they both agree that they would just prefer to, to touch and caress, that's perfectly okay. But there's a, lot of women, there's a lot of women and men in their 70s and even older that really still enjoy sexual activity um and again into their 80s and even 90s so it's it's of course less common in the 80s and 90s but it's still again if it's something that they um want to do it's it's something that we want to support we know that um uh retirement centers and sometimes even nursing homes um, have one of the higher rates of sexually transmitted infections so just like we've touched on already yes um, just because you can't get pregnant doesn't mean that other things can't get transmitted so um, it is important if the if 
the patient that we're seeing um, that we're seeing in their their single, divorced, widowed, et cetera, and they're wanting to engage in sexual activity, that it's so important to um, wrap it up, so to speak, like uh, Dr. Lacey's already discussed. Um, and then, <clears throat> you know, sexual health has so many other benefits for everyone, not just um, patients over 80 or 70, but, you know, cardiovascular health. I mean, it is, it is a little bit of a physical challenge and, and that can be a really good thing. It's a really fun way to get physical activity for some folks, um, but they also have to know if that's going to be a strain on their, their body, meaning um, it, it can, for some patients, set them up for potentially um, some heart conditions, especially if they're taking Viagra and things like that. So I think there's a little bit of a, a cautionary tale that we do have to inform our seniors, um, especially the males, but um, as well as the females about um, some potential risks, but we certainly, I think those are off, uh, uh, outweighed by the benefits of a healthy sexual relationship. I I always think Go ahead, Patty. No, I was just, I, I was just going back to our conversation before we started this is that, uh, when I was younger, I was working, I worked in a, uh, nursing home when I, through high school and, uh, and the, 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 the seniors are, they're busy little people. I'm telling you. And, and, and as we said earlier, on their hands. oh, they got a lot of time on their hands and, uh, the amount uh, you were saying the amount of women versus men have it made there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. Right. The, the, yeah. The ratio of, yeah. uh, yeah. Men to women. It's uh, definitely in, in, in the man's favor. I, I always get a kick out, and, and I'm sure Chris, uh, Dr. Vicar does as well, after we've operated on someone or someone's had a heart attack or they've had their prostate surgery, like a lot of the first questions that they ask is, doctor, when can I, when can I have sex again? When yeah, can we, absolutely. When can and that gives you a lot of hope. And then so like sometimes I'll, I'll be like, okay, guys, we're going to do Venus, not penis. Um, you know, no insertion because we just operated on this thing, but you can do very erotic non-insertional sex. And so I just use your imagination. <laughs> oh, I'm going to use that. I'm going to use that. Penis, that I love penis. it. <laughs> That's great. Oh, Dr. Iglesia, can we talk a, a, about finding love after the two divorce or two D's divorce and death? Yeah. I mean, it, what yeah. happens? You know, I, I find that really heartwarming, you know, because people are lonely. And I'll tell you, the, the, the pandemic has really, you know, even exacerbated that even more. Um, and so it, I, I have a couple recently that they were both um, uh, widowed and they were friends. And in fact, uh, one of the, the women was uh, best friends with the, the, the widower's wife. <laughs> That was her best friend. And so now they're hooking up and, you know, we're treating her urinary tract infections. But let me just say, <laughs> they're, they're, she's, they're very happy. Um, and uh, that just, that just um, you know, that kind of warms your heart to, to know that no matter the age, you still have that, that giddiness that can occur when, and the, the limerence that happens in a new relationship, it's kind of exciting. And so... I just, again, um, you have to actually make yourself vulnerable to it, right? Uh, and ma make yourself um, get out there a little bit. Uh, she had some funny things saying about how her best friend may be rolling in the grave, but she's having a great time rolling around the bed. <laughs> Good for her. I mean, yeah. Yeah. So. You know, it, and so it can happen. So you've got to be open to it, you know? Yeah. 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 And, and, and that, that thing about the women, they're like, well, Dr. Glazia, um, you fixed me. Can someone fix my husband now with the erectile dysfunction? And so obviously we have referrals for that because we're, stuff can be done and people are in tears, you know, about that. And I, that gets acknowledged, you know, the other thing, you know, that happens is that, well, where can I find these men? I'm not going to go on one. I'm not going to go on, on, on match.com or even millionaire match.com because apparently there is a millionaire match.com. Um, I just, I'm not that kind of person. And, and so um, sometimes it is more difficult for the women because of the ratio. There's, there's so few men. So I would be like, you know what? 
why why do you have to stay with someone in their 70s you know <laughs> maybe you could go younger <laughs> by the way statistically speaking they're they're less likely to have erectile dysfunction anyway we sort of joke about it but we just open and give permission that you know you don't have to limit yourself and then we talk about masturbation and self stimulation as well because um, you know Sex health is health and um, the importance of that just in terms of lubrication because we're talking all the time about prevention of urinary tract infections and blood flow and the microbiome and tissue turgor and how estrogen is helpful, but even um, self-stimulation and getting en engorgement is, is very, very helpful in maintaining um, the normal milieu, let's just say, an ecosystem in the vaginal area. So what you're saying is use it or lose it? Well, <laughs> what are you, Patty? <laughs> a little bit of maintenance is always maintenance. helpful for all areas. There yeah. you go. I like there that. There you go. There you go. I want to thank my guest, Dr. Christine Vaccaro and Dr. <laughs> Sherelle Iglesia for a great, fun, entertaining conversation. Yeah. And if you like what you heard today, please rate and subscribe to our podcast. For more information on the Patty Brisbane Foundation for Women's Sexual Health and our six focus areas, visit the Patty Brisbane Foundation.org. Remember, sex care is self care, and sexual health matters. Mm -hmm.